Hello guys and welcome to another episode of the Outdoor Boys YouTube channel. It is a gorgeous fall day here in the Dolly Sod Wilderness and I've got what's arguably the lightest backpack in the world and some of the lightest backpacking gear that money can buy. Well, right now it's about 65 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's gonna drop down to 22 degrees Fahrenheit tonight. It's gonna be proper cold weather camping. I got into ultralight camping gear and backpacking gear because I like to take my kids with me. And if you're gonna be carrying gear for two people or three people or four people, it needs to be light, it needs to be small or you'll never get very far. Hey, check out this beaver dam. You can see where the beaver's been pushing mud up to form a little dike. You can tell this is an active beaver pond because the mud is fresh. Yeah, you really don't want to mess with beavers. They're nasty little creatures. I once had to fight one in front of a troop of Boy Scouts while on a date with my wife. Vomited all over our stuff and we had to get rabies shots. This trail has turned to muck, which is a good time to talk about shoes. I prefer to have trail runners instead of hiking boots. Trail runners are basically lightweight running shoes that are meant for running on trails. They have good tread, lots of cushion, ultra light, and they're super comfortable. Sometimes they're waterproof, sometimes they're not. But honestly, I found that waterproof shoes don't really make much of a difference. Oh, oh son of a gun. Look at that. Ugh. That's wet. You know, this is pretty typical of my experience. The water always gets in the top. So I find it's much more important to have a shoe that dries out quickly and is easy on your feet rather than one that's a little bit taller or a little bit more waterproof. Hey, at least I'm getting the mud off. If hiking on uneven trail makes this part of your ankle and this part of your ankle really sore and fatigued, then you probably want more ankle support. However, if your hiking shoes are making the front of your ankle and your shin really, really tired, that means your boots are too heavy and they're wearing you out. I'm the type of person that doesn't have a problem with rolling my ankle, but lifting my foot up with a heavy boot makes the front of my foot really tired. So having a light trail runner is a big plus for me. Little mouse ran across my trail. At this time of year in the Arctic, the native Alaskans will be gathering mouse food. You go out into the tundra that looks kind of like this, you take a stick and you probe the ground looking for mice dens, and you find their winter storage of grains and seeds, and you dig it up and you take it. Get a little handful of seeds that look a little bit like granola, but it's a great way to find food sources that are too tedious to gather yourself. When it comes to backpacks, I'm really in love with this Z-Pax backpack. It's made from Dyneema, which is stronger than nylon, completely waterproof, and very light. If you're gonna buy a nice backpack, get a waterproof backpack. There's no reason not to. Well, where'd the trail go? Oh. Yeah, it didn't quite make that jump. Oh. Oh, here's the trail. An extreme ultralight backpack like this is not the first piece of ultralight equipment you should buy. Most of these backpacks are not designed to carry more than 30 or 40 pounds. And if you try to do it, you risk tearing the straps and it'll really dig into your shoulder. If you're looking for a light backpack that's more durable and it can really take more weight and has more volume, check out the Hyperlight backpacks. You know, I'm having all this conversation about lightweight gear, but if you want to lighten your load, the most important thing you can do is lighten yourself. I was getting a little fluffy, and about a year and a half ago, I went on a diet and dropped 65 pounds. Didn't do any exercise, but just shedding all that weight did more for my ability to go hiking and walk far than anything my gear has done. And it didn't cost me a single dime. It's not much fun, but it sure is cheap. All right. Yeah, trail kind of petered out here, didn't it? I know I've said it before in previous videos, but I love this Garmin InReach Mini. Not only is it a GPS, but it allows me to send and receive text messages via a satellite network. My wife can track my progress, see where I am, and I can send and receive messages. It's great. The battery lasts three days. 
I think I need to take a little snack break. The Z-Pax bags is one of the few ultralight backpacks with a waterproof exterior pouch. I love it. All right, I got two of my favorite trail snacks here. Got a bag of pitted dates and a cookie. One large date is 100 calories and just one chocolate cookie is 420 calories. In my right hand here, I have half of my average daily caloric intake. If you're gonna do any sort of serious hiking, especially with little kids, make sure you snack regularly while you're hiking. I find that if I go more than about three hours without stopping and eating something, my energy level starts to really drop off. With little kids, that drop is a lot sharper and more sudden, and they're really not good at regulating their own bodies, so you've got to do it for them. When my middle son was only four years old, we did a 20-mile hike in Hawaii, and I just put a 15-minute timer on my phone, and every 15 minutes I'd pull out some gummy snacks, and he'd have to eat a couple, take a sip of water, and we just did that all day long. If you or anybody else in your group starts to feel that energy dropping, first thing you gotta do, food and water. Ah, check it out. I think that's fox poop right there. You can tell it's really old when it gets that white mold on it. Well, it's been a few hours since that swampy bit. My shoes are already starting to feel a lot drier. I really think it's just better to have well-ventilated shoes that dry quickly rather than having waterproof shoes. We've only got about an hour left of sunlight and I need to find a spot to camp. I want someplace sheltered out of this wind. I'm gonna need a stick for my tent. Now let's just find a nice soft level spot. All right, that's pretty flat. As far as I know, this is the lightest tent in the world. Z-Pax makes this as well. It's the same company that makes my backpack. It's made out of the same material too, that Dyneema. These are the Z-Pax carbon fiber tent stakes. There we go, it's a proper one-man tent. Plenty of room for yourself and your gear, and it weighs less than any other tent on the market. And all you need is one stick or a tracking pole, and then you're good to go. And the floor in these tents is actually waterproof and very durable, so you don't need a ground sheet. There's a lot of Dyneema tents on the market, but this is one of the only ones that has a fully enclosed bug mesh, so you won't get bit up by the mosquitoes. This right here is my sleeping pad. It's the Thermarest Neo Air Uber Light. This is the lightest sleeping pad on the market, hands down. Those Neo Air Uber Light air mattresses are incredibly light. There's nothing else like them, but you will put holes in them. They are not durable at all. I've either patched or replaced that air mattress three times in two years. All right, this is my sleeping bag. It's the Western Mountaineering Apache. It's a 15 degree bag. The reason why I chose Western Mountaineering for this bag is it has the Gore-Tex Windstopper shell. Having a pillow isn't exactly a necessity, but I sure sleep a lot better with one. And this Sea to Summit Eros Regular is actually a really good comfort item. Hardly takes up any space or weight, but it sure is nice. Man, that sun is going down and it's starting to get cold. This right here is one of the lightest down jackets on the market. Mountain Hardware makes it. These down jackets are so light and they make such a difference in keeping you warm. And this right here is the lightest rain jacket on the market from Outdoor Research. The whole jacket just stuffs inside its own pocket. Now all of these jackets are designed to be extremely lightweight. They're not going to be very durable jackets. As long as you take care of them, they're great jackets. Well, one thing that takes up a lot of space and weight in your backpack is cooking fuel. So I invented something to try to solve that problem. Check this out. This right here is a stove. It's made from titanium, and this is my latest prototype. And this thing only weighs a little bit over one ounce, 51 grams to be precise, and allow you to cook an entire meal with a couple sticks. It's absolutely perfect for a place like this where there's not a lot of firewood. A bunch of dead fern. Got a couple little cotton balls soaked in Vaseline as a fire starter.
Oh, sun's going down and it's getting cold, so I'm gonna change into dry socks and warm pants here. I'm gonna put on my headlamp. This one's made by Nightcore, and I believe it is the lightest rechargeable headlamp on the market. But unfortunately, I seem to have forgotten to charge it, so I'm gonna use this one. Always bring a backup headlamp. Mm. Nothing like a hot curry to warm you up. Time to do the dishes. Got ourselves a little cup of herbal tea. So I'll put the boiling water in this Nalgene bottle, check it for leaks, shove that in our sleeping bag, and that'll keep us extra warm all night long. Just make sure it doesn't leak. All right, I think it's time to get into bed. You guys, it's getting late and I'm tired. I'm gonna hit the sack and I will see you guys in the morning. cold out. I don't want to get out of my bag. The ZPAX tent is a single walled tent, so anytime it's warmer inside than outside, you'll get condensation forming on the walls wherever your head is from all the moisture from your breath. It can get your bag wet. Like you can see right there my, around the edge. All right, I gotta get up. To get out, you can see where the condensation froze and turned to ice on my mat. Look at that. Oh, my air mattress has a slow leak in it. As it starts to lose air, bits of your body start to touch the ground and they get cold. Oh. Okay, I got a problem. My boots froze solid last night. They are a block of ice. Ugh. These are definitely frozen. <laughs> I always hate it when I do winter camping videos that are this cold with no snow on the ground. Cause look at it, it looks so warm and pretty. It's cold out. <laughs> I think I've got the ice broken up enough where I can get my feet into the boots, but I don't want to do it until I'm ready to hike. Cause when I get my feet in those icy boots, it's gonna, get them frozen. So I want the blood to be pumping and I want to be hiking when I do that. It's the last thing I'm going to do before I break camp. I'm going to stick the leftover boiled water under my coat, trying to warm me up a little bit. <coughs> last night as I was going to sleep, I could hear a bunch of large deer or elk go right over here behind this tree and one of them was coughing. I poked my head out of the tent to get a better look out of it and scared them all away. All right, time to break camp. I love this tent. It's so quick and easy to put up and take down. This titanium cools to the touch almost immediately. It's not a good sign when your toes are numb before you put them in your frozen shoes. There you go. My feet are so cold, it's painful, really painful. Got to get the blood going to my feet or we're going to have problems. Oh. Yeah, oh, it's cool down. Sun hasn't melted the ice yet. If I need to get my core as warm as possible. The reason why your fingers and toes get numb when you're cold is that your body is cutting off circulation to your extremities as a way of trying to preserve your core temperature. So if you want to warm up your fingers and toes, the best thing to do is to heat up your core really hot. If your core is warm, your body won't restrict circulation to your extremities, even if they're cold. In case you're wondering, no, I'm not going to get frostbite. It's just not cold enough. Frostbite happens when ice forms in the water inside the cells of your body and the ice crystals puncture the walls of the cell and kill the cells. It has to be significantly below freezing to get frostbite. But prolonged exposure to this kind of conditions can give you trench foot. You know guys, I can see some water. I'm gonna go refill my water bottle. When it comes to water filtration, this is the best system out there. Basically, it's just a large water bladder with a filter and a hose. Gravity pulls the water through the filter and you've got clean water. Just go ahead and put the hose inside your water bottle, give it about 30-40 seconds, and you've got a liter of clean water. 
which is really important because this river is basically a giant beaver toilet. These gravity fed filters are the best way to go, hands down. They are so much better than the old hand pumps. They work so much better than life straws or the filtered squeeze bottles. But if you have to go lighter than this, your options are chemicals or boiling it. All right, let's keep going. See these little cotton balls sprouting everywhere? Good fire tinder. Oh, the mud's starting to thaw out. Now a lot of you might be wondering, how much does this entire pack weigh? Well, I measured it before coming out here, and with everything, it was 16 pounds, three ounces. Almost five pounds of that is camera equipment, two GoPros, a selfie stick, a tripod, 15 batteries, and a backup battery and various attachments. Now the second biggest weight is water. I've got a liter and a half of water in here. And that weight also includes both of these jackets and the thermal pants I'm wearing. Oh, I can start to feel my toes again. Oh, it feels nice. Oh, the beaver's been busy here. Oh, we're back at the beaver pond. Notice how the beavers cut back all the brush around the pond. They do that so that they can see predators coming. They're not very tall, and when they're out of the water, they feel vulnerable. If you're a homeowner with beaver problems, take note of this. If you go and you cut down all the brush along the water, that's an open invitation for beavers because you've just improved their line of sight. Ah, oh, there's the car. Well, that was fun, but let's go home and I'm gonna show you a little bit more about the gear I use on this trip and some of the gear I didn't get to bring on this trip. If you don't want mildew all over your tent, you gotta dry it out before you store it. Same goes with the sleeping bags. All right guys, just real quick, let me show you some other options for lightweight gear. So this is the one man tent we used today, and this is the one man e-bivvy from MSR. It's just a little nylon tube and your sleeping bag and your mat fit inside, and it allows you just to have a little bit of protection. No good in really extreme weather, but, it's a fraction of the cost of a lightweight tent and a fraction of the size and the weight. Another option is to get a Dyneema tarp. They're about a third the weight of a nylon tarp, but when you compare it to a Dyneema tent, you only save a little bit of money and a little bit of weight. So in the end, I usually just go for my tent. So let me give you another comparison. This is the one man Z-Pax tent we use today. This is the two man version. Even though the two man tent is more than twice the volume of the one man tent, it's not twice the weight. Additionally, the two-man tent comes with optional tent poles that you can buy as an add-on in case you wanna use tent poles instead of two sticks. So honestly, I end up using the two-man version even when I'm by myself more often than not just because it's a lot more comfortable for just a little bit extra weight. All right, let's talk sleeping bags. So this right here is a generic 20 degree bag. It's filled with synthetic insulation. It's pretty big, it's pretty bulky, but it works well. This right here is the bag I use today. It's a 15 degree bag. It's filled with goose down and it's made by Western Mountaineering. It's less than half the volume of the synthetic bag. This right here is a 20 degree sleeping quilt from Enlightened Equipment. Because sleeping quilts are so much more efficient, you can see that they're just much smaller and much lighter. But if you wanna see something really crazy, this right here is the smallest, lightest sleeping bag in the world. It's a 60 degree mummy bag made by a company called Yeti that's from Europe. I think it's from Germany. Look at me, I'm an inchworm. This is actually the extra long model and it is a really slim cut. It's like wearing full body skinny jeans. <laughs> but they don't sell this in the United States. I had to import this thing from Europe. All right guys, these are my shoes. This is the pair I was wearing today, and they're all right. I like them well enough, but I love these. These are the Ultra Lone Peaks, and these are the lightest shoes I've ever felt, but yet still have really good support and cushioning. But if it's cold, I tend to use these insulated Merrells. They're really comfortable, and they're 
warm. They're great when it's a little bit below freezing. But if it's really cold, these Solomons are amazing. I absolutely love these. For a negative 20 winter boot, they are light and comfortable and a really great boot. So this right here was the air mattress I was using today. And this right here is the next lightest alternative. But this Sea to Summit Etherlite XT is one of my favorite air mattresses on the market. It's so comfortable and very, very reliable. Honestly, I wouldn't use this one unless you absolutely have to because of the weight limits. Whenever I can, I use this one. All right, here are three bags from three different companies and I really like these three bags. This is the one we were using today. And this right here is another Dyneema bag from a company called Hyperlite. And you can see it's much bigger. It's also much, much more durable. But the z Packs bag actually has a frame and this one does not. And this one only has the mesh outside pocket. Well, the z Packs bag has the waterproof outside pocket. Over here, this is a bag from a company called Gossamer Gear and it is insanely light. It weighs less than a daydream. It's just insane, but it is not waterproof. This is just a fancy nylon material, so it will soak through and that is a huge downside. Both of these bags are waterproof dry bags. Individually, these are all great products, but cumulatively, they have a massive effect on what you have to carry in your back. Let me give you an example. Over here, I got a basic backpack like you get at REI. I've got a self-inflating mat also from REI, a 20 degree, a synthetic bag and a one-man tent from Alps. Over here I've got the Z-Pax backpack, the Z-Pax one-man tent, the 20-degree quilt from Enlightened Equipment, and I've got the Thermarest Neo Air Uber Light. This sleeping bag barely fits inside. This bag with all my old gear in it weighs 14 pounds and you can see it's about 60% full. The Z-Pax bag, four pounds, four ounces. The bag's only about 30% full. But here, check this out. I'm gonna go ahead and put the two-man tent in here, another sleeping pad, and another sleeping quilt. I now have two quilts, two pads, and a two-man tent in my bag, and it's only halfway full. And it's only six pounds, two ounces. If you're taking little kids backpacking, this stuff is a lifesaver. Well, we've got guests coming over tonight, so I better clean up the basement. But hopefully you guys have enjoyed this video. If you wanna see more tips and tricks for camping, check out our videos and click subscribe. We put out new videos every Saturday morning. And don't forget to check out our camping and adventure playlist. I'll put a link in the video description below. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next Saturday. If you like this video, don't forget to check out the Outdoor Boys YouTube channel where we have hundreds of videos just like this. And don't forget to click subscribe so you can see other great videos every Saturday morning. And hit that bell button so you'll get notifications. Thanks for watching.